Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Red Light Report. Today is going to be a relatively quicker episode, but we are going to cover three pretty darn interesting pieces of photobiomodulation research. Some topics we really haven't covered in some time, if at all. So they're, so they're pretty unique. Some things we haven't talked about. I know we've been talking a lot about sleep and a lot about the brain and some different skin issues, all which are very important and very uh, popular for people to be wanting to treat. But there are some other things that we'll dive in today, such as hair loss, how red light therapy can help that, fat loss. So decreasing the amount of fat cells or adiposity on your body. And then lastly, we'll look into insulin resistance. That's how unique it is. Photobiomodulation therapy and its potential for helping with insulin resistance. So those are the three we'll cover today, not necessarily in that particular order. But regardless, again, some pretty unique ways the red light therapy, again, can impact our physiology with the mitochondria being the root cause with all of it, which is why red light therapy can help so many different things. So we'll start without further ado and jump into the first article here, which is the one having to do with hair growth. So this works for both guys and gals, more so guys if I had to take a guess, but females too with, with hair thinning or hair loss could be for a myriad of reasons, could be some hormone imbalance, could be stress, could be hereditary to a certain degree. So it can work both for males and females. So this will touch both sides of the genders here. And this article is from August of 2022 out of the Journal of Biophotonics, and it's entitled Enhanced Hair Growth Effects Through Low-Level Vortex Beams Radiation in Experimental Animal Study. So not only is this an interesting one that uh, we're looking at red light therapy and hair growth, but we're going to talk about something I hadn't heard about till I read this article being the vortex with a V and how those could play a role with hair growth. But let's move on to the introduction here in the article. They go on to say that Andre Mester first reported the promoting effects of series low-level ruby lasers on hair growth in the shaven back area of the rat in 1968. Evidence suggests that photobiomodulation therapy targets on the mitochondria within cells and alters cell metabolism through photodissociation. Photobiomodulation therapy induces telogen to antigen transition. Telogen is the end phase of hair growth, meaning the hair no longer is growing, whereas antigen is that growth phase. So again, photobiomodulation induces telogen to antigen or the end of growth back to regrowth or growth phase. So red light therapy kind of takes it out of that end phase and brings it back into growth phase. So I'll say that one more time. Photobiomodulation therapy induces telogen to antigen transition of hair follicles and prolongs the antigen phase. The red and near-infrared light absorbed by cells enhances the affinity of some transcription factors, which accelerates extra protein synthesis. These extra proteins participate in cell proliferation and migration, resulting in the improvement of cytokines, growth factors, and tissue oxygenation. And this is where it gets a little interesting. Optical vortex beam carrying orbital angular momentum has highlighted its unique advantages in particle traps, biomedicine, microscopic imaging, chiral identification, and medical diagnosis since its discovery in 1992. Different from Gaussian beams, the intensity of vortex beams on the axis is zero because of the helical phase or the helical shape. And just think about if you're going to open a bottle of wine with one of those cork removal things, how it has a spiralizing thing that you you put into the cork. I'm not very eloquent right now, but it's that spiral shape that they're talking about with this vortex, that helical shape. But regardless, the improved photobiomodulation structure using vortex beams is simple and has achieved better results in the treatment of rats 
which is of great significance for studying the photobiomodulation therapy effects of different life structures on biological tissue and the treatment of hair loss. And also the high order vortex beams penetrate much deeper into the biological tissue than the ordinary Gaussian beams, which we consider to be one of the reasons for its remarkable hair growth effect. And so in this study, the control group was treated only with ambient laboratory light. And different from the normal control group, the vortex light group and Gaussian light group received their corresponding light for 30 minutes at 10 a.m. every day. The topological charge of vortex light was 32. The article didn't really go into detail what that meant, and I don't really know what that means, but for those who do know, the topological charge of the vortex light was 32. So there you go. The wavelength of the lights was 650 nanometers, so very solid in the red, and the energy density was 4.25 joules per centimeter squared, which just, you know, off the top of my head seems relatively appropriate for a hair treatment dosage. Not too low, such as a skin treatment, but really not that high because really you don't need to go that deep into the body to stimulate the hair follicles when treating with red light therapy. In the methods, there wasn't a ton of information. That's kind of what I got. We do know that they used red light versus near-infrared, uh, relatively low density. And again, they were comparing a control group, which was treated with just ambient light. So just like fluorescent or incandescent light. And then the other two groups, one of them was treated with that vortex red light. And then just that typical Gaussian beam, so to speak, just that straight beam that we're all used to with, with either a laser or LEDs. And so then when we look at the results, they go on to say that of the 18 rats involved in the study, six received ambient laboratory lighting. The remaining 12 rats were divided into two different treatment groups to receive Gaussian light and vortex light, and all rats were monitored for their hair growth. Hair regrowth was observed in control group at day 10, while it was rarer and shorter than that of the Gaussian light group and vortex light group. This trend became more apparent at day 20. According to the experiment, we found that the average hair length of the vortex group was 16.9 millimeters, plus or minus, which was significantly longer than that of the Gaussian light group at 13.2 and the control group at 9.9. So again, vortex was 16.9, Gaussian 13.2, and control group 9.9. And so if you see the pictures in the article, and I'll leave the uh, link to this article in the show notes, you'll see that there are three rats that they have. One's the control, one's the Gaussian, and one's the vortex light. And they all have their back kind of shaved in a rectangle or square where they're not completely bare to the skin, but it's most of the hairs removed. And that picture, you can see that the control group basically looks like it's still mostly shaven. The Gaussian looks like it has a lot of its hair back, and then that vortex light group looks like it's almost back to normal as far as its hair length. So you can see there's definitely a distinct difference between control versus Gaussian versus that vortex light. So even that picture alone is pretty astounding and kind of proves how much more effective this vortex light seems to be for hair regrowth. But moving along in the article here, they go on to say that the majority of hair follicles in the vortex light group were in the antigen phase confirmed by Chi-67 staining. I could be butchering this. It's Ki-67 staining. So I'm calling it Chi-67 staining. While most of hair follicles were in the telogen in the control group, which is pretty interesting. So the vortex, most of their hair follicles were back in that growth phase, again, going out of that telogen into the antigen, whereas, of course, the control group wasn't being treated with anything, just the normal light that the mice were used to on a day-to-day -day basis, and their hair follicles remained in that telogen out of growth phase for the hair follicles. And so similar findings were noted in Gaussian light group, but not as dramatic as in the vortex light group. So, Again, the Gaussian is kind of the in-between here, but a little closer to Vortex, whereas Vortex mostly in the antigen phase, Gaussian had some in the telogen and a lot in the antigen phase. So a lot of hair growth, but not as much as that Vortex light group. And so they, they finish up the article by saying, our results showed 
that low-level vortex beams resulted in better stimulation of hair growth than the Gaussian beams, and low-level vortex beams can also make more hair follicles stay in the antigen phase. The improved photobiomodulation structure using vortex beams is still simple and has achieved better results in the treatment of rats, which is of significance for studying the photobiomodulation effects of different light structures on biological tissue and the treatment of hair loss. However, the optimal wavelength, coherence, and dosimetry parameters remain to be determined. Of course, that's how most (laughs) articles end. We're still looking for that perfected protocol for each and every single treatment type. Pretty interesting information here. I don't really have the savvy or know-how of the engineering behind, you know, vortex lights versus Gaussian lights and how that would have to be engineered into a product. But I'm hoping people that do engineer products or that, that are in that space, for hair health especially, take this article, read it thoroughly, and potentially put it to use in their products. So again, I don't know how that would look for these red light therapy helmets or these red light therapy hats that are using LEDs that again are giving you more of that uh, coherent light. Whereas again, this article is pointing to that vortex light. I don't, I don't really know what that looks like from an engineering perspective, but if it's possible, looks like it's more effective for hair health. But let's move along to this second article. And with this bad boy, I couldn't get my hands on the full article. I could only get the abstract. But the topic's so intriguing, I wanted to even just go over the abstract with you guys. And this is the one about insulin resistance. I thought this was pretty interesting because anyone and everyone dealing with diabetes or if you're pre-diabetic or you, you know someone that is, this is pretty important information, especially as the world seems to be increasingly headed towards metabolic syndrome and one of those has to do with insulin resistance. And so this article, just like the previous one, came out in August of 2022. It's from the journal Photobiomodulation, Photomedicine, and Laser Surgery. So there you have it. But again, I'll I'll leave the link in the show notes for you guys. In the abstract here, so the background here, as we know, insulin resistance is the main risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. And non-invasive and non-pharmacological therapies, such as exercise and diet, are effective in treating insulin resistance and diabetes mellitus 2. However, adherence to them generally is low and diminishes positive effects in the long term. Photobiomodulation therapy is another non-invasive and non-pharmacological therapy which produces positive effects on mitochondrial metabolism, oxidative stress, and inflammation generally linked to insulin resistance and diabetes and may improve or attenuate the severity of these diseases. And even that last part, that's equally important. You may be able to improve or prevent, but also attenuate the severity of insulin and diabetes. So anyway, the objective of this narrative review was to focus on the available literature related to the effects of red light therapy or photobiomodulation therapy on insulin resistance. And so the results that they found, they go on to say that, in fact, recent in vitro and in vivo studies have demonstrated improvements in insulin resistance in skeletal muscle, adipose tissue, and hepatic cells, or liver cells, mediated by photobiomodulation therapy. Further, there is evidence that photobiomodulation therapy can potentiate exercise-induced improvement in insulin resistance through ameliorating mitochondrial dysfunction, reducing inflammation, and modulating oxidative stress. Moreover, reduced adiposity and altered gut microbiota also appear to mediate photobiomodulation effects on insulin resistance. So pretty interesting. We know that exercise is amazing for normalizing insulin resistance as they noted in the background. Well, guys, the holiday season may be over, but you can still save big. We've had this for some time now. BioLite has what's called bundles. So simply go to the BioLite website, BioLite.shop, go into products, and there will be a tab for bundles. With each of these bundles, there's three of them, you save 20% off on the entire package. For example, we have the Beauty Bundle, which includes a Shine and Stand, a Guardian Plus, and the Longev Revive Cream. So that bundle of three products, you save 
save 20% off the entire package. There's the recovery bundle that includes the recharge plus panel, the guardian mouthpiece, and then the longev recover cream. And that recover cream is just like the revive cream, except it has added CBD oil infused into it. That package of three items all comes at 20% off. And then the last bundle, which is the most versatile bundle in the sense that you get to pick and choose what products you want. You get to pick and choose from the Recharge Plus panel, the Restore Plus panel, or the Matrix Full Body Mat. And then you get to choose between the Guardian and Guardian Plus. And then you get to choose between the Revive and the Recover Cream. It also includes the Shine and Stand, so you get to choose between Black and Silver. By purchasing those four products in the Ultimate Bundle, you save 20% off all of the products. You also save 20% off shipping. So literally, the entire package and shipping is 20 20% off. So if you're ever needing some red light therapy products and are looking for a discount, just remember the bundles are always 20% off, 365 days a year, no coupon code necessary. And of course, we know that in previous studies that I've talked about or in the ebook that I've written, we know that combining red light therapy with exercise leads to an enhanced fat reduction or fat loss when you combine the two versus doing either one on their own. And so again, as it relates to insulin resistance, exercise seems to help, red light therapy seems to help, and they they have a synergistic effect if you do them together. So I think you can kill multiple birds with one stone if you're exercising in front of your red light therapy device. Again, you're getting the benefits of exercise, both for all the many health benefits related to exercise, but specific to this topic, insulin resistance, and then red light therapy. Red light therapy enhances your exercise performance. Red light therapy accelerates fat loss. And apparently, red light therapy also helps with insulin resistance. So again, combining the two as often as possible seems to be a, like a pretty powerful one-two punch. And so the conclusion of this narrative review is they go on to say, although these results are exciting, Randomized clinical trials are urgently needed to confirm the clinical relevance of photobiomodulation therapy in the treatment of insulin resistance. Investigation about the effects of photobiomodulation therapy combined with different volumes of physical exercises may also contribute significantly for those patients having difficulty to adhere to the recommended minimal exercise volume. Finally, Studies on photobiomodulation therapy parameters, such as dosimetry, wavelengths, uh, single point versus full body irradiation, are also necessary for the appropriate prescription of photobiomodulation therapy for the treatment of insulin resistance. So that got me thinking, as far as synergistic treatments, well, that's why exercising or working out outside is so beneficial if you're getting that sun exposure, if you have a lot of sun exposed and you're exercising. And then thirdly, grounded. So people that are doing Tai Chi or yoga or even some walking or sprints or running or or what have you outside on the grass with a lot of skin exposed, whether it's uh, like a tank top or shirt off, what have you, you're getting a lot of these benefits that we're talking about But of course, this is specific to red and near infrared light. But if you do this early in the morning where it's mostly red and some infrared light and you're grounding, and again, you're getting exposure to that light plus exercise benefits, it seems like that's the way to go if you can. But of course, specific to this topic, red light therapy, and we're talking about using devices. So, and I've told you guys this before, whenever I can, especially in the winter, When I'm down in my basement on my stationary bike, I'll have my shirt off and I'll have a panel irradiating most of my body, especially my upper body, to get these benefits, especially the fat loss benefits. But apparently, it could also be helping with modulating or normalizing my insulin levels or my mitigating any insulin resistance, I should say. Just some food for thought. Again, this was just a narrative review. It's not like they conducted actual research. And to their point, they began the conclusions by saying, although these results are exciting, randomized clinical trials are urgently needed. And so that's exactly what's needed to corroborate this narrative review is we need some randomized clinical trials to definitively prove whether or not red light therapy can truly help with insulin resistance. And then if it can, what are the parameters or kind of head us in that direction so we know which 
spectra of light, which intensity, frequency, all that good stuff. So we can really start wielding red light therapy for insulin resistance if it can truly help. But moving along to the last article here, and this one has to do with losing fat or fat loss with red light therapy. So this is a pretty popular one for people getting into red light therapy. This one is from the article in Journal of Cosmetic and Laser Therapy, and this is from September of last year, 2022, and it's entitled Effects of LED Photobiomodulation Therapy on the Subcutaneous Fatty Tissue of Obese Individuals, Histological and Immunohistochemical Analysis. So this is specific to obese individuals, this article is, but I think we can extrapolate it to its uh, physiological benefits for adipose tissue in general. But let's begin with the intro. Uh, The mechanisms by which photobiomodulation therapy can affect fatty tissue are still controversial, and it is hypothesized that photobiomodulation therapy could induce micropores in the adipocyte membrane which allow the release of intracellular lipids and place them outside the interstitial space, or an alternative hypothesis is that photobiomodulation therapy stimulates mitochondria in adipocytes, which in turn increases adenosine triphosphate or ATP synthesis with subsequent activation of cyclic adenosine monophosphate or CAMP, promoting lipolysis ultimately. And the third hypothesis is that it just depends on the dose applied in photobiomodulation therapy. This can even stimulate adipocyte cell apoptosis. So all that to say, there is still no clear physiological basis for its mechanism. Another important photobiomodulation therapy fact for the reduction of fatty tissue observed in articles already published is the difference in the wavelengths used. And in some articles, the photobiomodulation was carried out with the red wavelength, around 630 nanometers, and in others, infrared of 808 or 850 nanometers. So it is believed that each of both red and near-infrared light must reach different depths of the fatty tissue and thus favor its reduction. However, there is still no standardization of the protocol for fat reduction using red or near-infrared light. So given this scenario, this study aimed to verify the real mechanism of action of photobiomodulation therapy when used in association of the wavelengths red at 630 nanometers and infrared at 850 nanometers in the subcutaneous fatty tissue through a clinical study with histological and immunohistochemistry analysis with markers of lipolysis and apoptosis in the subcutaneous fatty tissue of these obese individuals. So that was a lot of scientific wording. So these guys essentially used red and your infrared light to irradiate the subcutaneous fatty tissue in obese individuals. And then they used various scientific means to look at markers such as lipolysis or fatty breakdown and apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, to see if they could verify what the mechanisms of fat loss via red light therapy is. So in the methods, this is what they give us. Participants received seven sessions of photobiomodulation therapy LED twice a week the last session being about 20 minutes before the surgical procedure of bariatric surgery. The therapy was performed on the left side of the abdominal region following the linea alba. So the linea alba is that strip that goes right down the middle of your abs. So if you see someone with like a perfect six-pack or eight-pack, whatever you want to call it, that line that goes straight down, that's the linea alba. And so they were irradiating just the left side of the abdominal region following the linea alba the right side of the abdomen was considered the control because they weren't going to irradiate that right side. And really, that's all they gave us for methods. We don't know. Of course, they told us 630 nanometers and 850 for red and near-infrared, respectively. But they didn't tell us light irradiation, so the light power. They didn't give us the duration of the treatment, the total dosage of the treatment. So kind of frustrating that we didn't get more details, but we do know that they used LED versus laser, 
But that's about it. So we are going to move straight to the discussion where they go on to say that apoptosis is the main mechanism for the elimination of cells from the biological system during development to maintain homeostasis in normal tissue, allowing the formation of new cells and the elimination of others that have already performed their specific functions. Devices that act to stimulate apoptosis of the fatty cell in an obese individual has beneficial metabolic effects since the fatty tissue is an organ that in an adulthood will rarely grow due to hyperplasia. We also demonstrated that in tissues treated with photobiomodulation therapy, there was an increase in the number of macrophages, especially in areas adjacent to fatty tissue. According to other researchers, macrophages play a central role in the lipolysis process and their presence indicates inflammation during autophagic lipolysis, that is, during the cell self-destruction mechanism via apoptosis, a well-recognized process and scientifically established. These evidences demonstrate that photobiomodulation therapy is able to stimulate fatty cell death and consequent lipolysis. This ability may be correlated with the use of LED and the association of wavelengths used during the procedure. In our study, we used the association of red at 630 nanometers and infrared or near-infrared at 850 nanometers. The LED cluster provides for irradiating larger areas when compared to laser, leading to a homogeneous stimulus throughout the treated area, favoring cell responsiveness. Another point in our study was the novelty of irradiating the treatment area with the association of these wavelengths. We know that each wavelength reaches different structures in the tissue, but it is not known exactly what the difference of this depth is. The action of photobiomodulation therapy on obesity is still poorly studied. However, some researchers have already evaluated the beneficial effects of adjuvant therapy in the treatment of obesity and its associated metabolic diseases. Various researchers have shown in experimental studies that both infrared and red photobiomodulation therapy can exert its therapeutic effects on changes in mitochondrial function, reduction of the pro-inflammatory state of obesity and glucose metabolism, such stimuli are possible due to the reduction of fatty tissue. And so lastly, in their conclusion, they finish off by saying, the use of photobiomodulation therapy to LED, so using LED versus laser, associating red and infrared wavelengths sequentially was able to promote autophagic lipolysis induced by adipocyte cell apoptosis in obese individuals. These results indicate that this therapy may be promising in reducing the thickness of fatty tissue, and therefore it can be considered an adjunct therapy in the treatment and prevention of obesity. So not necessarily the strongest piece of research by any means, because I, I do believe they started off with around 20 subjects in this article or in this research, and they finished with 10 uh, due to various reasons. So, you know, 10 is not the largest number to go by for statistically significant results. But regardless, they did get some pretty interesting results regardless based on, you know, the findings they did get. So they're pretty confident that red and near-infrared light does indeed help with fat loss for various reasons. So again, I would liken it back to what I was saying earlier as far as relative to the insulin resistance. Whenever I'm exercising, indoors at least, whether it's yoga or again my stationary bike or lifting weights, I'll be irradiating my body with red light therapy. And for me, that's primarily to help with exercise performance, and then any little bit of mitigating fat accumulation or, or if you want to call it fat loss, you know, that's great. So it's a combination of all those things, exercise performance, and now I'm going to throw insulin resistance into the ring, you know, based on the, that narrative review. Of course, I'll wait for stronger research to come out in the future to toot the horn. But so, so exercise performance, insulin resistance, and then mitigating fat accumulation or aiding in fat loss, however you want to look at that, improving physique, we'll call it. 
So just by combining exercise and red light therapy, you could be killing several birds with one stone. But don't forget also the mental aspect of exercise. And of course, that boosts your your mental health, whether it's the endorphins, you know, when you're doing aerobic exercise or even when you're lifting weights. But then combine that with red light therapy and the the mental boosting or anxiety, stress-reducing capabilities of red light therapy. So you could even toss that into there as well. So you got exercise performance, insulin resistance, fat loss, mood boosting or or stress reducing, if you want to look at it that way. So at least four things easily the red light therapy can help you with when you combine it with exercise. So I'll just throw that out there for uh, all those exercise enthusiasts or those who aren't. Maybe that'll give you some more motivation to do some exercise while you're doing your red light therapy every day or most days. But for today, guys, that's what I have for you. Some three interesting topics. Again, we, we covered vortex light for hair growth, the potential for red light therapy improving or, or helping with insulin resistance. And then lastly, like we just covered, the potential use for red light therapy and reducing your fat adiposity or reducing the amount of fat cells you have in your subcutaneous fat tissue. So pretty interesting stuff, as always. Again, just more ways that red light therapy can be used. And, and again, I, I've said this once and I'll, I'll say it again, that you may be using red light therapy for one thing, and I, and I just broke it down there with the exercise, but you may be using red light therapy for one thing. Maybe it's for reducing pain, but hey, you also may be improving your insulin resistance or you may be helping reduce fat cells or, or you may be helping enhance lipolysis you may be helping just increase your ATP production, which helps with a myriad of physiological processes. So again, that's why red light therapy is so cool because you'll be using it for one thing, but you'll be getting the benefits of of a couple dozen things. But I don't need to tell you guys that. You know that. You've been listening for a while and, and understand the power of red light therapy. So thanks every single one of you who have listened to the end of the podcast. If you've made it this far, high five. I'm super impressed because I know that was a lot of science and 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 it can get a little dry with the research every once in a while. But hey, if you're interested in this stuff and interested in the information, then it is pretty cool stuff. I mean, we're basically watching red light therapy become more and more special and have more utilizations day by day, month by month as time goes on and the research is is the proof. So it's pretty cool to see it happen in real time. And it's cool for me to be able to report it to you guys. And hopefully you guys apply it to a certain degree, or if you're people out there or other researchers, you know, you find it useful, or if you're someone who is about building products or or stuff like that, it kind of gives you some ideas to work off of. Uh, so I hope that this podcast works on on multiple levels for for all different types of people, and just for red light therapy enthusiasts who just love the information and want to know how they can be using their devices at home on themselves. So hope this podcast serves you know each and every one of those types of people. And again, thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next week. I'm gonna have a pretty cool interview with a gentleman. I think you guys are gonna really love learning from. So I'll see you next week on that episode. But until then, you guys have a wonderful week. And as always, light up your health. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop in our YouTube channel, BioLite. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.